John chapter 2. Jesus has just picked his, um, some of his disciples, there's six of them now, and they just got invited to go to a wedding. And so they're going to go to a wedding, and we're going to follow them as they go. And um, remember that as we, the very first message that we preached from the book of John, it, it was said this, the purpose of the whole book written was that you might believe and that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so um, he's going to perform a miracle tonight, the first ever miracle that he's performed, which that right there tells me if you have a, like a Catholic Bible, they have books in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Maccabees, I think it's called Maccabees, and the Apocrypha. But in those books, in those writings, it talks about Jesus as a boy, and they make up fanciful stories, something like he was down in Egypt and all of his friends and him, they all made clay pigeons, but Jesus touched his as a little boy and his turned into a real pigeon and it flew. And, and they have these sort of fanciful stories and miraculous things that Jesus did, but the, the Bible tells us in here that this is the beginning. This is the beginning of miracles. And so there was no miracles before this. Uh, God began here to do his work. And so let's begin reading. In John chapter, um, John chapter number 2, we'll read verses 1 through 11 tonight. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So that's about, uh, each one of them was about 20 gallons, what I could find out, about 20 gallons, so all in all about 120 gallons, like a fish tank. Maybe you've got a home and you want to put a fish tank up on this little table here. That's about the size, a 20-gallon fish tank. So that's what these were, six of them. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and, he say, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I want to speak to you tonight with this thought. Christ wants his disciples to know that he has power to perform miracles. Christ wants, he wanted them to know, and I think he probably wants us to know this too, he has power to perform miracles. If he wants to do it, he, he can. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for a good day today. It's so nice to come together and, and be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, and sing songs of praise to thee, and watch our children perform, and Lord, just have a good time of fellowship and songs. And now, Lord, we come and we want to look at your word. And as we study the blessed Son of God, I pray that you would help us tonight. Help us to, to read your word and understand it. And then, Lord, if we could, please apply it to our lives, uh, that we would be closer and better servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and draw closer to you. Please bless now the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Christ wants his disciples to know that he has power to perform miracles. Well, how did he teach them that he had power? I kind of think of this, this whole thing as mm, maybe you've, you went to the first day of class or a high school, the first day of class in a college, and after the introductions, you kind of get the first little taste of what this class is going to be like. And I think this miracle is kind of like mm, session one of walking with God. You are going to see some things, dear disciples. Jesus has not become famous just yet. His fame has not spread abroad. Uh, he's just at this miracle. Uh, he's at this wedding. 
and there are six of his disciples who just really started walking with him. And I think this is their kind of introductory course to, you're getting ready to see some stuff, walking with the Son of God. For the next three years, you'll be in his company and seeing what he does and the power that he has. But, you know, turning water into wine, okay, maybe doesn't seem like a very impressive thing, but at the same time, that is very impressive. I mean, who, who can do that kind of stuff? But I think it was just kind of like, I'm going to show you guys, this is the beginning uh, of what the power the Lord Jesus had. Let's look at three wedding day events. And event number one, there was a problem here at this wedding. They ran out of wine. Look what it says there in verse number three. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto, saith unto him, they have no wine. Maybe this was a kind of a poor man's wedding. Uh, certainly, Mary and Joseph, as the Bible would teach us, they didn't have a lot. They were not like the wealthy, high-end type people. And so probably the, the wedding that they're at is friends of the family. You know, maybe not, they're not so wealthy themselves. They're just having a small wedding. They know Mary, and they say, well, we should probably invite Mary and, and Jesus and his disciples they can come to. Uh, he's got disciples? Yeah, he's got a few disciples. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know about it, but, but anyway, yeah, tell Mary to come on over. Maybe Joseph has died. I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, Mary is invited over. So it's this kind of it's probably a small wedding, uh, probably not the most glamorous type thing that we would think in our Western culture. Uh, it should be noted that Jesus was invited on this occasion. I like this. It's always a wonderful thing when he's made welcome at a wedding. Amen. And he ought to be made welcome at weddings. And if you have not gotten married yet, maybe one day when you're married, go ahead and invite Jesus. Amen. <laughs> uh, let make sure he's a guest at your wedding. Before the, hey, he ought to be the guest uh, before there ever is a wedding. Um, but when, when you get married, man, make, make sure Christ is exalted. And make sure he gets the invite, because that was a, a good thing at this particular a wedding. So he's there, and uh, there's a problem. Verse 3 says, when they wanted wine... Um, the mother of um, Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. And so, you know, the, the situation rises, they've run out of wine. The wine failed. They had no more. And, and that's how it is really with the, with the world. The world can never satisfy you. This wine runs out and there's nothing else to satisfy them. There's a want which the situation cannot meet. They want wine, verse number three, they wanted wine, and they have no wine. And that's how the world is. Uh, the world always runs out. The world cannot satisfy you. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Ecclesiastes 1.8 says, All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Proverbs 17, 24 says, Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. And so it is, many people today are looking for satisfaction that just, it's just lacking. They look around, they want to be satisfied, and I don't know about how it was with you, but I remember going through that in my life. That was before I had the Lord. And even, hey, watch this, even after I had the Lord, if you don't seek Him, you still may find yourself, I'm not satisfied in life. I remember being in the Air Force, my first assignment was at Indrilic Air Base, and I was an AFN broadcaster, and I began to look around, and I had God, but He didn't have all of me at that moment, you understand? And I thought, man, there's got to be more to life than this. I need to become a, I'm, you know, this, this is how stupid you can become. I thought, I need to become an NFL wide receiver. Now you talk about ridiculous. I'm five foot seven, 165 pounds. If I stepped on the field, with, they would kill me. I mean, I literally would die. But that's the, but we had, a, I remember Heinz Ward, he's an he's a all-pro guy, and he was great. He visited the base and was doing morale things, and, and I interviewed him, and I, and I sized him up, and he was about my size, my height and stuff, 
But one of the big differences, when he turned to the side, this dude was as wide. I mean, it was like, whoa, that's, uh, and, and he was just tough. But I started thinking, I, I, I even, I think I challenged him to a foot race. Of course, he smiled and went about his business. Uh, but I was like, we should race sometime, you know. Because I had in my mind that I'm not satisfied in life. Maybe I need to become um, an NFL football player. I'm talking about just pathetic. <laughs> and then I also watched some of these jets take off and thought, man, maybe, maybe that's where I'd find satisfaction if I could be an F-15 pilot. And that would be cool. I could mean I would be an F-15 Strike Eagle pilot. That would be cool. But the truth is, the man without wisdom, his eyes are in the ends of the world. He's grasping a straw. He's looking for everything. Maybe this would satisfy me. Maybe this would satisfy me. Maybe this would satisfy me. But the truth is the world will never satisfy you. A believer especially, we sometimes get to the place where, yeah, we're saved, but man, we're looking for some more. I want more out of life. Well, really, we ought to look for Christ. He he will satisfy you. But the world couldn't satisfy them. The wine failed, uh, and they, they had a want, and they couldn't be satisfied. I like what... Solomon, he concluded, he said, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And that's life if you want to go through it without God. At the end of it, you'll conclude, I, I hated life. It's, there's no profit under the sun. There's no reason for living. If I don't have God, there's no reason for living life. And, and uh, that's what Solomon Concluded, I ask you tonight, are you happy in life? Are you content? Are you satisfied with your lot in life? You know, Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And so it's possible, it's a reality for believers who walk with the Lord, you can be content. But the problem here at the, at the wedding was, hey, there was a, a want, but they didn't have, they couldn't meet the need. But the solution, event number two at this wedding, the solution was the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says there in verse number three. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now what did Mary mean there when she said, they have no wine? I mean, this is an interesting Mm, transaction between the, the mother and her, and her son. And I don't think, as I've read this and studied it, I don't believe Jesus was rude or disrespectful to his mom here. And the more I studied this, this, this saying, woman, what have I to do with thee, that was not um, disrespectful. It would have been very respectful and very tender. Would we expect anything less than the Son of God who wrote the rules, honor thy mother and thy father, no doubt he's going to honor his mom uh, at this time. So I think what happened was they want wine and Mary says they have no wine. Now some people think that she meant by that, that was an indication we need to get out of here. <laughs> they can't supply our needs, let's go. That's a, that's a hint, subtle hint, let's get out of here. Uh, some people believe that. Um, other people thought, you know, now's the time she was saying, they have no wine. In other words, why don't you start talking? Why don't you do a discourse? Why don't you give us enlightenment and, and give us a, a great conversation? They have no wine, so why don't you uh, supply the, uh, the conversation piece for the evening? But I think what's true here is she said this, they have no wine, and his reply is telling, uh, he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. That, I think, tells us what her intentions were. I think it went like this. Mary says, they have no wine. I think she's implying, hey, now's the time, perfect opportunity for you to demonstrate who you are. Let everybody know who you are. You think about Mary. For 30 years, she had grown up with him as her son. No doubt when the angel came and said, you, that holy thing is going to be the Son of God. The Bible says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So she knew who he was. Perhaps uh, because of the, the virgin birth, probably her whole life was one mm, big question mark. 
well, did that, who was that? Joseph's, they say it's not Joseph's son. They say that that's the son of God, but come on. And so how would you like to live with that your whole entire life? And maybe at this point Mary says, they have no wine. Now would be a great time, Jesus, to vindicate who you are, to vindicate me. I've been trying to, you know, I know that I didn't do that, and, and, and I know you're the Son of God. Now would be a great time to show that. And that's when Jesus, I believe, puts his arm around his mom and says, woman, very tenderly, very sweetly, because he's going to honor his mom. Woman, maybe grins and shakes his head. What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now his hour was coming. His hour on the cross and and then when he would be buried and then his hour would come when he would rise again from the dead. And when he did, everybody knew, oh, Mary was telling the truth always. Mary, that was the son of God. And he told her, woman, what have I to do with thee, mine hour is not yet come. I think it was a sweet transaction, sweet conversation there, as she's saying, hey, maybe now's a great time to do something amazing. And Jesus hugs her and says, hey, mine mine hour is not yet come. But then uh, verse number five says, his mother saith unto the servants, I underlined this in my Bible, this is some great motherly advice, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. (laughs) Amen. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And what a wonderful, um, does that, that's just a great thought there tonight for us. You want to apply something to your life. Hey, whatever Jesus says, do it. Whatever the word of God says, just do it. Whatever, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so, the Bible says, verse 6, there were, uh, there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. You know, the Jews were big into ceremonial cleansing. Not necessarily big into hygiene, but they were really big into you got to go through all of these rituals and make sure you wash your hands and do this. And I think this speaks about, you know, there's a a ceremony that always accompanied with Jews, and even is today, and it even is with many people who are religious. They have a lot of ceremony that they need to go through. A lot of outward show. But Jesus, this miracle, he, he, he changes the inside, amen? <laughs> he changes the inside of those water pots, and he now, it's not something on external, it's something that's internal that he's going to make new, and when that is poured out, it's, uh, it's a life changer. Notice how they respond to him. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, verse number seven, and they filled them up to the brim, amen. That's applicable to us. Somebody said, brimful obedience brings brimful blessing. When they said, fill them up, when Jesus said, fill the water pots up, they didn't say, well, how far? They just said, he said it, so we're going to go all the way. I mean, we're going to obey to the very top. That's what God wants of your life and wants of my life. Just obey God to the very top. Just try obeying God. My pastor used to say, obedience changes everything. Try obeying the Lord and see what changes. I want to tell people all the time, they come and they're going through tough times and this, that, and the other, and I just want to say, just try obeying God. Just try obeying God. I mean, and I just say these five things, I always say them, but number one, read your Bible every day. Have you been reading your Bible? Number two, pray every day. Just obey God in these things. Spend time in prayer. Number three, when the church doors are open, unless you're sick or you got to work, make it make your schedule where you come to church. And the other things do not take precedence over the gathering of the believers. Just try that out. I've never met a family that does that, that they, I mean, you know, man, they're, they're a strong family. Family that stays, that prays together, stays together. Family that attends church together, uh, serve the Lord together. Just, just try obeying is what we're talking about here. These servants obeyed. Whatsoever he says, you do it. He says, fill those water pots up. And they filled them up to the brim. Brimful obedience brings brimful 
blessings. Five things. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Attend church every day. Tithe your income. Uh, be a giver. God loves a cheerful giver. It's his, all his money anyway, and he blesses us with it. We ought to give back to the Lord. And then number five, be a witness. Tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Share the gospel. Go find somebody. There's, there are, we live in a, a city of 34 million, most of whom have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's our job, to go do that. Whatever he says, you just do it. Read your Bible, pray, uh, go to church, tithe your income and witness. Just do those things. Just obey God. And obedience changes everything. All believers would profit greatly from heeding Mary's advice on this occasion. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so, what ends up happening is Jesus performs a miracle. And he takes that water and changes it into wine. And the Greek word there, wine, is oinos. And that's a generic word. It can mean fruit of the vine, like grape juice. And it's used in that way in Matthew 9, 17 and also Revelation 19, 15. It also can be translated as, intox not translated, but understood as an intoxicating wine. It's used that way in Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine. Uh, and also 1 Timothy 5, 23. So this word means, mm, can mean either one of them. So then preacher, what, how do we figure out what it's talking about here? Well, the Old Testament makes a difference between strong wine, wrong kind of wine, intoxicating wine, inflaming wine, uh, and pure grape juice. There's a difference. The Old Testament talks about Noah and Lot became drunk on wine. Drinking this kind of wine may have caused the death of Aaron's two priestly sons, who were both killed by God in Leviticus chapter 10. It was for the sin of national drunkenness that God would destroy Israel, Isaiah 28. Daniel refused to defile himself by drinking this kind of wine, Daniel 1.8. The book of Proverbs warns against this kind of wine, Proverbs 21 and 23, 31 and 32. Habakkuk forbids the giving of this wine to one's neighbor, Habakkuk 2.15 and 16. So, was it, did, and this is a great question, we're not going to get too sidetracked, but I do want to deal with it a little bit here. Did Jesus make this into alcoholic wine? Or did he make this into grape juice, non-fermented? You meet a lot of people these days, if you want to talk about, um, you, know, we ought to, you know, our position at this church is abstinence, amen? We just don't touch the stuff, just stay away from it. You'll never get in trouble if you, if you take that. But there are a lot who will then throw, if you go into work tomorrow and you say something like, my preacher said you shouldn't drink wine, you know what they'll say to you most likely? Well, Jesus turned water into wine. As their defense. That's what they'll say. And so, you know, the question is, okay, did, that's true. He, he turned water into wine. Did he make it into alcoholic, fermented wine, or did he make it into pure, some of the best grape juice you've ever had? And since it doesn't say, then we need to, we can ask some questions. Okay, well, we can determine this based on circumstances, the occasion, the material you used, the person making the wine, and the moral influence of this miracle. The occasion, a Jewish wedding. The material was water. That's, that's a good thought. He took water and turned it into wine. Much like later on he'll take bread and make more bread. And now he takes wine, uh, takes water, that comes from the rain, it goes into the ground, that root of the, the vine uh, goes up into it and it goes out through the branches and it forms that grape juice. Just like Jesus took that bread and bypassed all of the uh, necessary things for that wheat to be planted, grow, and then turn into bread, he bypassed all that because, by the way, he's the one who set up all that. He's the one who came up with the order of planting, it'll grow up, then we'll take it, harvest it, and become bread. He was the one who ordained all of that. He's the one who ordained that there should be a root in the ground and the water would come down and it goes up through the vine, uh, throughout through the branches and become juice in the grape. And all Jesus did was he took that water and bypassed that whole process and I believe he turned it into 
beautiful grape juice. Just like he would later do, he bypassed um, uh, the, the processes here. The operator was Jesus Christ. The same in the beginning, fixed that law by which the vine takes up water and converts it into pure, unfermented juice. And the moral influence of this, okay, let's ask this. Is it derogatory to the character of Christ and to the teachings of the Bible to suppose that he exerted his miraculous power to produce 120 gallons of intoxicating wine? Does that seem in keeping with the character of Christ? Wine which, by his own inspiration, he said it's a mocker. Strong drink is raging and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. He, he, his own book says it bites like a serpent. His own book says it stings like an adder. Are we to believe that the God-man himself used his miraculous power to create 120 gallons of intoxicating wine? In this miracle, Christ did instantly... What? By the laws of nature he had ordained, it would have taken months to grow and ripen. Psalm 104, verse 14 and 15 say that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man. And so I believe the correct interpretation of this is he did not make alcoholic wine. He made beautiful grape juice. And he did that by taking the water, speeding up all the processes that he had put in place anyway, and turn it right into grape juice. He just bypassed it going into the ground, going up into the roots, going out in the, in the months that it would take to form in those beautiful uh, juice of the grape. He bypassed all of that, like he did later on with the food. He bypassed all of the wheat, and he just made bread and kept on making bread because he's God. He's the one who set up these processes, but he can also overrule them if he needs to. And I believe that's what he did here, and he created beautiful grape juice. Augustine held this position. Chrysostom held this position. Dr. Joseph Hall, Bishop of England, in 1600, held this position. Dr. Trench, Archbishop of Dublin, held this position. Sir Humphrey Davy, uh, a scholar, says this, It has never been, of alcohol, he says, It has never been found ready formed in plants. Now, he's a, here's a, here's a um, French chemist, Count Chapteau. He said, Nature never forms spiritous liquors. She rots the grape upon the branch, but it is art which converts the juice into alcoholic wine. See, alcohol is not a naturally occurring substance. It doesn't occur naturally. Dr. Henry Monroe says, alcohol is nowhere to be found in any produce of nature. <laughs> Amen. It was never created by God, but is essentially an artificial thing prepared by man through the destructive process of fermentation. Professor Liebig said, It is contrary to all sober rules of research to regard the vital process of an animal or a plant as the cause of fermentation. The opinion that they take any share in the morbid process must be rejected as an hypothesis destitute of all support. He's just simply saying that this hypothesis that uh, nature creates alcohol he said that is completely unsupportable by all science. These are chemists. These are doctors. These are learned men who are saying alcohol is not a naturally occurring substance. Man gets into it and adds his destruction to it. And fermentation, putrefaction, and decay are processes of decomposition. So we ask again, can it be seriously entertained that Christ should, by his miraculous power, make alcohol? An article abundantly proved not to be found in all the ranges of his creation. Do we really think that God did that? Can it be believed that he, by making alcohol, if he did that, then he just sanctioned the making of it and the giving it to his creatures when he better than all others, knew that it in the past had been the cause of temporary and eternal ruin of multitudes. And he, better than all, knew in the ages to come it would plunge multitudes into the depths of eternal damnation. 
Do we really believe that God made 120 gallons of fermented alcohol? No. So when you really begin to look at this, it doesn't come out. The best and surest way to avoid drunkenness is to have nothing to do with alcoholic drinks. Amen. Which produces it. How, how does a person become a drunkard? He start, Hey, nobody ever woke up one morning and said, you know what, I'm going to become alcoholic. Most people, they think, well, a little social drink won't hurt me here and there. And they take that first drink. And then take that second drink. And then they take that third drink. You go talk to the man out on the street tonight who, you go down to the Fusa train station. Often he's there just laying on the ground. I mean, you know, saliva all over. It just looks terrible. And he's got a bottle of, looks like some kind of sake right there. And ask him, if he could, if he could honestly stand here tonight and testify, he would testify and say, I didn't intend to be like this. But I did take drink, and the old saying goes like this, a man takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And that's true a lot of times. And so, um, did Jesus turn water into wine? No. I mean, yes, he did. But did he turn it into intoxicating, fermented, alcoholic wine? No way. The Son of God is not going to use his miraculous powers to create uh, something that's not even natural. And he knows that ruined lives in the past and will ruin lives in the future. And if he made that, he then in a way sanctioned the making. No way. He made beautiful drinking grape juice. And it was delicious. And man, I'd like to have a drink of that. That would be good. Wine made by God. Hallelujah. There was a problem. The problem was they ran out of wine. There was a solution, Jesus. And can we say this evening, Jesus Christ is the solution to all of our problems. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but his person, his power, his love, his care, uh, his guidance, he, he is the solution to all this world's problems. And they, the world has all kinds of problems, and Jesus is the solution. And we don't have time to get into it, but he would be the solution to all the problems. They don't want to hear the solution because they want to keep on going in their sin, but Jesus Christ is the solution. He's got what it takes to fix your problems tonight, too. Wedding event number three, and we're done. The effect. Look at what it says there in verse number nine. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So the effect was his glory was seen and his disciples believed on him. Amen. I believe that's what God would like to affect on us tonight. Why should we trust in God? I like this. You see this order of the reverse uh, way of things working. This wedding, and this is the way of the world, watch it now, this is the way of the world, the world sets out the best in front of you. They put the best out front. And after a little while, you know what it ends up? The worst. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, man puts out the good wine, the best they got, and it ends at the worst. And isn't that true in life? They, they, you know, all these beer commercials and all these ads and all everything, they put it out there like, this is what you need for your life. This will make you happy. And you end up going down that road, and guess what you end up? Not happy. Not happy. Worse off than when you started. That's the way of the world. They, they make it look good up front. They want you to buy that car. Well, this car is great. Then you buy that car, you drive it off a lot, and what happens to that car? You find out, man, this ain't, <laughs> this ain't as good as I thought it was going to be. The, the engine light just came on. And you find out that this, this, they painted a pretty picture, but the end of it is, it's worse. I think about the prodigal son. He wanted to get out. He wanted to get away from mom and dad. He wanted to go out and see the world. And he went and he said that he went there and he had all kinds of friends and just lived it up. But at the end of it, um, he wasted his substance with riotous living 
And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And ends up he goes and eats with the hogs. See, the world looks good, but it's the way that it finishes is terrible. But you contrast that to the order of Christ. Jesus Christ puts out the good stuff at the beginning, and it doesn't do nothing but get better. Now, granted, the very first cup that you have to drink of the Lord Jesus Christ that He gives you uh, is a bit mm, dissatisfying because it's the cup of you're a sinner. But once you drink that, you say, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a sinner. Then He gives you the cup of salvation. Amen. And that's that good wine. And man, you drink that and think, this is great. But this is as bad as it gets for us. If you're a believer here tonight, this is as bad as it gets for your life. And praise God, I'm saved, and it's good to meet and be with you that are saved, and, and man, we are rejoicing, but can I just tell you, it's going to get better. It gets better. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me and He's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And what's it going to be when we get to heaven? <laughs> this is why they believed in Jesus, because man has this order that looks good at the beginning, but the truth of it is it ends terrible. Jesus' order is it looks good at the beginning and finishes even better. Amen. He's the answer. He's the solution. His glory um, was manifested. I believe this was just the beginning, as we'll get into it, but I believe this is just the beginning, walking with Christ one-on-one. You're going to see a little bit of the power of God. And when Mary comes and says, they have no wine, puts his arm around her and says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. I believe Jesus was a very personable person. Because those little kids love to come and be around them. And if you're a mean old cuss, I don't think kids like to come and be around you. <laughs> they run away. But Jesus was attractive. He, he, had a, he was kind. Uh, he was God in the flesh. And I believe he honored his mom and said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And then she turns around and says, Whatever he saith to you, you do it. And he says, Y'all fill those water pots up. And by the way, all we are is water pots. God wants to use you. And he says, fill those things up. And they filled them up to the brim. Amen. Amen. They obeyed as much as they could. That's a good preaching right there. Obey God as much as you can. They filled it up to the brim. And he says, now draw it out. And they turned, that thing got turned into delicious, refreshing grape juice. And the governor of the feast found the groom and said, hey, man. Man's way of doing things is put the good out front and then it gets bad. But you've kept the best to last. And in that we learn Jesus Christ starts with the best and it only gets better, amen. And uh, he's the wonderful Savior this evening. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this miracle, this first miracle that you did, demonstrating your power, how your disciples believed in you and it manifested uh, your glory. And God help us just to be like those servants and hear the advice of uh, Mary as she said, whatever he says, you do it. God, may we be like that and may we understand who we serve and the power uh, that you have, that you can do miracles, you can do whatever is necessary. And Lord, we love you this evening and thank you for your amazing power, your great grace, your great love that you have toward us, a bunch of sinners. But God, you're so good to us and we thank you for that. Please bless now the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As Miss Misako plays softly on the piano, God spoke to your heart this evening. We invite you to come. If you're here tonight and you're not sure about your salvation, we invite you to Christ. As always, we are sinners. We've sinned against God and there is a penalty for our sin, but there's good news tonight that Jesus Christ, this one who turned the water into wine, lived his life demonstrating who he was and then he died shed his own blood in our place he was buried and rose again and all who will believe the Bible says you'll be
be saved. God will impute righteousness to your account. He'll take the righteousness of the one we've been reading about tonight, the one who said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His righteousness, his obedience gets imputed to the account of the person, man, woman, boy, girl, mom, dad, the person that will believe God imputes righteousness to your account. Amen. And then, dear Christian, Jesus Christ is the answer. We got problems, he's the solution. He'll be glorified. He's got power, he can do it. Whatever the need this evening, the altar is open, we invite you to come. <clears throat>